in my oh this one hold on this is fantastic Best and send you outside Ooh. oh look at they made the the shrimp fritters fantastic we got dan and Drish, John, Drick. Oh, he's got a new background. I like that one. Nice. Very it's nice. The red grapes. It's no, he's on the, they're on the, yeah, those are red grapes. So. Uh-huh. It's Riesling, man. Get some Riesling. <laughs> All right. Hey, at least I, I, I finally got the right wine to drink. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, J Gus has the right wine. Gus has the right wine. Co has the right wine. Um, I almost, I, I, I almost opened a Chardonnay, and I'm like, wait, I should check what wine it is today. <laughs> Chardonnay's next week, actually. Um, right, next week, Zach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Paul, I'm unmuting you. I'm putting you on. You know that next week is the Library Chardonnay, right? It's 15 Chardonnay. So, yes. if you want Chardonnay before next week, just answer me back before next week. Okay. I will do that. Perfect. All right. What else is going on today? How you guys all doing? Rubbing mm -hmm. in. Uh oh. Eighty-three. That is an eighty-three Mosul Riesling, you guys. That's rubbing it in. So, why are you tired, Ed? What have you been doing? You got it muted. Oh, it's just uh, well, crazy downtown. Because we live in downtown Seattle, where all the uh, the the craziness is. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been drinking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we ran out of Riesling, so uh, we're now we're moving back to rosé. Oh well, we can get you more Riesling, uh, but rosé is fine too. Rosé works. <laughs> All righty, we're gonna give everybody. What are you drinking, Tony? Uh, uh, I have a I have a 2012 Uplands Estate uh, Rhone blend, the Julian, also okay. known as a Red Riesling. Just kidding. Red Riesling. <laughs> so, George, do you know where Upland Estates is on Snipes Mountain? Are you unmuted? Let me make sure you can talk. Oh, I'm having trouble with my. I'm Unmuted. I'm, I've got. I can see you, but I, I lost everybody. I need Julie to come down and help me. We'll go get her. Yeah, go get her. Well, okay. If you'll hang on, I'll go get her because I can see you when you start talking, and then I can see Tony. Okay. Well, that's all. Now I see you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, technical difficulty here. Um, what is that? Let me just try the gallery view on the top right. Well, top, let's see. Yeah, I'm not getting, um, okay, I'm rejoining, I guess. I don't know. George also um, decided to leave the Corona hotbed of Washington and go hide out in a cabin in Michigan. So uh, his internet is not the best, but his. There, now I've got you, okay. So, um, okay, no, I've got it. I don't know what happened, but I've got everybody. Okay. Okay. So I see Gary, I see um, Hugh, I see Tony, I see Paul, Ed, Natasha, everybody's there. Okay. All right. Cool. We're ready to start. Okay. Perfect. We are? Okay. Well, what are you drinking? Oh, Riesling? I don't have a Riesling. I'm drinking a farmhouse... Belgian. <laughs> well, good friend, that. That's, that's Sorry, <laughs> grapes grow kind of slow around here. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, cheers, everybody. Welcome to happy hour. Yeah. Okay. And uh, even if you. So I was gonna just go through some. Oh, okay. Oh, we gotta talk about the food well, first. Talk about the food. Yeah. Mom made okay. food. Okay, so mom made pretty food. Who all made the recipe? Becky said she's still cooking. Hi, Harv. And Cindy made the fritters. So these are the shrimp. Hello, hello. Nice. Scott and Robin made them. Those Good. Are beautiful. Um, the shrimp uh, corn fritters. 
with the zest of uh, lime and um, cilantro, mm -hmm. which pairs really nicely with a Riesling. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a nice dinner. I think you get that. We're trying to get some things that can morph into dinner or appetizers. So it just depends how big you want to make them. Um, but anyways, I think they're really nice with a little lime on them for with the Riesling. Yeah. So enjoy. I mean, Riesling is super versatile. Um, as we know, it goes with everything. But this 19 is so, it's just got so much of that lime and citrus that this is a great pairing. And um, because we then talk about the wine, we've talked about the Riesling. We, I do though want to show a couple pictures of the Riesling block because we're talking about geology today. And um, I should introduce George. The... So Julie, who should be joining us soon, did a, a leadership development program with me uh, a couple years ago for people in natural resources. So farming, forestry. Hi, Julie. Hi, Julie. Um, farming, forestry, fisheries, DNR, stuff like that. And Julie is a forester. And one thing I thought, wine took a long time to grow. And then I learned about trees. And that's like a whole nother level of long cash to cash cycles. Um, so that's pretty crazy, but really interesting and fascinating. And her wonderful husband, George is a geologist. So he likes to come out to the vineyard and teach me all sorts of things that, cause every time I think I know something about geology, then I talk to George, which is just fun. So since you guys were asking about geology, I'm going to preempt some of the stuff that George is going to talk about by showing pictures of the Riesling and the fold belts. So our first Riesling picture is right here. So as we know, the Riesling is this block. It's up at the top of the hill. We have Nugget because you always need a dog in the pictures. Uh, Julie is probably the only person who has larger dogs than I do for the record. Um, and then up above the Riesling, there's the rest of the, these hills, which are part of the Yakima fold belt. So George is going to talk more about these hills later. And then uh, he's going to talk about the upthrusts of, of these hillsides. And part of it, then we'll go back to the, one of the other views of the, the vineyard that we look at a lot. But you can tell this hillside it was up thrust with all of this tectonic plate movement that George is going to talk about. But since we're in the vineyard, it's dad's turn. Dad, do you need me to unmute you? Hold on. Okay, wait. I can't get him unmuted. Um, there you go. Can you hear me now? No, we can. Okay. So first of all, the bandana is because our governor wants everyone in the vineyard to be wearing a mask. And so when I go in the vineyard to talk to the ladies, when I go in the vineyard to talk to the tractor driver, when I go into the farm store, I got my mask ready to roll. Okay, yeah. so we got two pictures, one from the Syrah. And um, that's you can see where the clusters are. Um, farther along than last week in terms of setting the fruit the um that real aura of the pistols has changed and so you begin to see the berries actually formed and so we're making really nice progress it's not completely uh set yet but it's well in the way and so next week the berries should be bigger so then we'll go to the Cabernet vine. I think that was your cap picture, because then your Syrah picture is that one, right? From your leaf architecture, it looks like that anyway. No, this is the cab because uh, the cab had more flowering. It had more clusters. Um, mm -hmm. The shoots on the right were the ones we started with, and they, they didn't have much action, but the next uh, shoot station over on the cordon or the arm uh, has these different clusters and I don't know if you can do closer up care uh, but if not the so you can start to see the berries forming there there's little brown uh, caps that 
uh, didn't come completely popped off and the fertilization occurred underneath those and we'll see what kind of luck we have um, next week because that again should change. So things are moving along very steadily. It's been a cool spring. The other thing, there's been a lot of wind and so that affects the set. So, That's my report from the vineyard. <laughs> and I will, <laughs> I will post on the uh, De Brule Vineyard Instagram page today because my phone and my camera are newer than Dad's, so my close-ups of the grape of the of the berry flowers are are better because of my phone. So I'll post that on the De Brule Vineyard Instagram page today, um, so you can get a little bit of a better view of that. And then I'm going to mute Dad. Unless there's any other questions for dad before we kick him out. Nope. Crickets. All right. Um, so without further ado, George. Okay. Well, I don't think I can compare to those beautiful slides that you have. I've just got some, some slides from a, a book, you know, those are beautiful. The, but anyway, I'm going to go ahead and put them on because I have to have something, you know, to talk about geology a little bit. So I've got my slides here um, somewhere. You told me to, uh, here we go. Let's see. There are no official bandanas, Tony. Um, if we were faster, I need to go. we'd get around to um, if we're masking for years, you might get Coponable masks, but until then, <laughs> probably not. There we go. All right, we see you, George. Well, I got to go to a different slide here. So let me go back here. Let me let's go back here. I, okay, how do I go back? Because this is blocking my view of how I manipulate the slides. Sorry about this. See, I got to go. I don't know if I can do it there. No. I got to go page up. Just, just oh my, use the scroll yeah, on your right. Do it. Okay, now hit. okay, so here I'm going to go. That's my last slide. So I'm going to go up to here. Okay, so what we see here is uh, the view from the space station, basically. Oh, and um, this is a, what's that? Still on set. Yeah, this is a, there you go. sorry, Carrie? You're good now. Okay. So anyway, this is a view of the extent of the Columbia River uh, basalt flows. And this is a, a view of the Columbia Valley AVA, America Viticulture Area. And you got to tell so, them because they're cool. Say again? To tell us about the basalt flows. Why do we have basalt flows? Well, I'm going to tell you about it, but I, I, what I was going to say in this area, there's basically five different soil types. Two are bedrock, two are glacial, and like you said yesterday, you've got alluvial soils that go from glacial time to now. So the bedrock soils formed in this area, so the Columbia River basalt flows started about um, 17 uh, million years ago and what happened was the North American plate overran a, uh, a mantle hot spot kind of like Hawaii does and so the mantle hot spot um, where we first see it was out here in the Olympic mountains and that formed the crescent formation that kind of wraps around then it kind of went away a little bit the North American plate moved to the northwest and then the Columbia River basalts came out of fissures out of here and they cover just a huge area. There was um, over 41,000 cubic miles of lava that came out over this period um, in over 300 flows and uh, in the in the center of this it's up to three miles thick so it was just it made it all the way out to the ocean even made it past the ocean. I mean, they went under sediment here. They came out of Cannon Beach. Just a huge um, amount of lava that came out. And this this mantle hotspot is not done. It kind of waned, and then it, it migrated along the Columbia River 
uh, or the, sorry, the Snake River Plain down here. And now it's hiding under um, Yellowstone where it's encountered a big thick continental crust that doesn't want to melt and it creates these geysers and occasionally about every uh, oh half a million years a super volcano that you know cools things down for us you know when it blocks the sun so um, anyway while this thing is is going off again this is over several million years the Columbia River is routed to the north around here and and same with the um, with the Yakima but rivers are flowing in here from here in all different directions and they're forming um, in, in lakes and rivers and so on. Between the lava flows, you get um, conglomerates and sandstones that, um, that are called the Ellensburg Formation. There's also the, the, um, the Vantage Formation. And what was the highlands that you, um, mentioned there's also a, a formation that's par all part of the Ellensburg um, Snipes Peak um, conglomerate those kind of things are all various formations anyway if I go to the next slide um, while these um, lava flows are, are forming Oregon is um, pushing into the soft belly of Washington the Pacific plate and the North American plate locked at this time along the San Andreas and it started creating, Carrie had a beautiful picture of some of these um, thrusts here. These traces are um, called anaclines, literally ridges. And I'll show another slide that, that shows troughs. So there's ridges and troughs, and they're called anaclines and inclines. And this is the trace of the Yakima and Columbia River about 15 million years ago. And so, for a long time, as this uplift was happening, these rivers were able to keep up with it and they, through, and they formed what are called water gaps. They just cut through these basalt ridges that were forming. Eventually, whoops, um, they couldn't keep up. Uh, uplift was too fast. And so the rivers, both the Yakima and the Columbia, were diverted further and further east. Meanwhile, the salmon clear water had created the Walu. Walula, Walula Gap, which is important later. Um, but you can see that um, uplift is continuing. The rivers are continually getting diverted further and further east until finally the, the ancestral salmon clear water catches them. And they all go down through the Walula Gap there. So if I go to the next slide, um, what is the next one? Here you just see the, the trace of the um, the anaclines and synclines, some of the hills that Carrie had shown. And if you look at the little arrows, the ones that extend out, like here, Horse Heaven Hills, that's a ridge, that's, um, that's an anticline. And then if you look where, the, where the, um, the ridges come to, or the little arrows come together, that's a valley or trough, um, and that's known as a syncline. Oh shoot, what am I doing here? Technical difficulty, just stand by. Oh, okay, my little cursor, I'm not, you do it. Okay, that well that, no, no, I wanted to go up one. Oh, okay. oh I'll do that one, that's better. There you go. Oh, I'll use this, okay, no, okay. There you go, we got Okay, it. <laughs> so then the other thing is these water gaps are, are known by this thing right here. There's these little symbols there and that's where like, the Union Gap and places like that, where you've got a real steep um, valley cutting through the through the bedrock. So this is the way the modern um, drainage system is now. And um, so if I go down to the next slide, so starting about um, two million, two and a half million years ago, the Earth went through an ice age. Started, and this is the extent. Um, there were several ice advances and retreats over the last two million years, but this map shows the extent of the um, Cordilleran, or if you're in Canada, the Cordilleran um, ice sheet um, at its maximum about, about um, oh, 18,000 years ago. And you can see oh, a little over in here, there's an ice dam, and this um, dammed up the Clark Fork of the uh, the Clark Fork River and created um, glacial Lake Missoula, which is all the way out in here, it was quite deep. It was like 
1,800 feet deep, extended way past uh, Missoula. And as this ice started to melt, then this ice dam broke. And very suddenly, within about a week, uh, 500 cubic miles of floodwaters were just unleashed upon the land. And they flowed across what's known as the channeled scab lands. And, um, and just flowed everywhere. You can see this is, that's Lake Missoula there and that kind of darker gray. The lighter gray is just where these floods occurred and they, they ripped out coolies and all that stuff that you see, you know, driving across the, the landscape out here. And what happened was they're going along and sure enough, they hit this um, um, water, water break, water gap right here at Wallula. And they, um, the water backed up and it backed up the, um, the Yakima River and the Walla Walla River quite a bit as it flowed through the Wallula Gap. And it left behind these deposits of silt, sometimes several feet thick, before it finally all flowed back on down towards Portland. And so this happened, and you know the water's out, but the the ice wasn't fully melted yet, and so it kept coming back. It redammed um, the Clark Fork again, and this happened repeatedly, over a hundred times. They've they've. Um, this happened after the last ice age, and if you drive up the valley of the of the Yakima or Walla Walla, you can see these deposits, and they're all they're all banded, um, and so that's uh, and they they're on um, Carrie's vineyard underneath in the lower parts, and um, so this would be the um, the third soil type. But while this is happening, the um, the sea level of the world is about 300 feet lower than it is now. The climate was very dry, and you get these huge windblown um, dust storms. And what those did was deposited fine grain silt all over the landscape, and it's known as LUS. And you're probably familiar with it. You've seen it, you know, in the Tri Cities. It's thick. The Palouse is all this windblown fine grain dust, and that covered everything. It covered the um, so it covers the um, the basalt covers the Ellensburg conglomerate and, um, and sandstones, and it covers the uh, Missoula flood deposits. And so that's kind of the fourth soil type. And then on top of that, then you get um, Ice Age and modern day uh, river and alluvial fans that, um, well, I'm going to go down here. Let me click this one. Anyway, this is just a um, modern drainage and it just shows um, the, the AVAs of the of the local area and you can see Carries is up there where it says AVA Carries is right up here and um, okay right in there and so this is taken from a field trip guidebook that I pull out of my library anyway um, and you can see Horse Seven Hills all the different AVAs and they're all they have very similar, um, you know, some have basalt, some have Ellensburg conglomerate, they all have lus and, um, and alluvium usually. I don't know all the ones, but uh, oh, I'll use my cursor here. This is a close up of Carrie, well, and, and Hugh and Kathy's vineyard here. Um, it'd be number four here. And if you, um, if you believe Eric Schuster, uh, Carrie, what he tells in his, his book is that the, um, the uh, um, northwestern, northeastern part of your um, vineyard, at least back in the day when he did this, was um, um, thinner soil, thinner loose soil developed over caliche cemented um, glacial alluvial fans that have to be ripped. You know, if you're creating the, I remember seeing the um, the uh, irrigation ditch and that I could see a lot of caliche in there. And for those of you who don't know what caliche is, it's um, calcium carbonate cemented um, soils that occur in, in desert conditions where groundwater um, rises to the top, then it evaporates and leaves behind salts and, and it just gets cemented and it's very hard. Then you go down um, the hill and the, the central and southern parts are Lus over the Ellensburg formation, and there's there's rounded quartzite cobbles, um, you know, that were brought in by rivers between the basalt flows, and then you go to the um, 
the southeast part down in the in the valley there, and that's where the um, Columbia River or the sorry the Missoula flood deposits are. And you've got lists over those guys. And again, I'm getting this from Eric Schuster Hughes, so don't um, you know I, I I've been there twice. You gave me the grand tour, um, but we were looking at at your lovely grapes, you know. So um, that's kind of the the um, four different soil types there. I didn't see any basalt on your, um, in your area, but it's right below the surface and it's important in, um, you know, in the groundwater and how it derives um, the, um, the, how it produces the soil. And then Carrie told me yesterday and, um, that you have low potassium in your soil and basalt is very low in potassium. It's almost nil. And so I guess that's, that's good in grapes. So one final slide I have here, um, about um, five million years ago, the Cascade Range started to, to really come up. And what that did was um, block all the westerly um, rainstorms that hit us on the, on the west side where Julie and I live and created a nice dry climate in eastern Washington where you could starve the the grapes and kind of, you know, make them do their thing, put all that sugar and stuff into them and make for good wine. So that's kind of the synopsis that I have anyway. <laughs> and Carrie, you could probably add something, but anyway, so I'll, well, I have a question. Any, yeah, ask questions. Sure. Um, well, Adrish says, what makes the Rattlesnake Hills a different AVA? And I'm guessing, George, do you know the difference between the AVAs within the Yakima Valley? Or should I answer that? Um, you should answer that. I've, ha I've had lectures on this. I mean, geologists are fascinated with wine. They probably like to drink it more than grow it, but they're interested in soil and what makes it different. I know that AVAs were first recognized in, in France where they had limestone and, and clay and they the monks couldn't understand why certain grapes grew in certain soils and they kind of figured it out, but that's kind of the history. But I don't, I don't know. I know they have to petition and get all this approved. And so you could expand on that. Can I, can I maybe ask, um, like clarify that question a little bit? So if you go back to the previous Please. picture, yep. um, it looks like the AVAs typically follow the boundaries of um, kind of the fault lines that you'd shown. The only one that looked sure. like it was its own AVA, but yeah, like, you know, there's like a, a rattlesnake kills AVA boundary that just seems, I guess, more arbitrary. Yeah. Well, the AVA, you're right. So the Snipes Mountain AVA is, the hillside, the, but there, there are some pretty arbitrary things in both the Yakima Valley, because it's a political soil mm -hmm. amalgamation. And because when you draw an ABA, you draw the line and soils don't follow lines all the time. So one interesting thing about the Yakima ABA is on the north side, um, it fall, it goes to the top of the ridge line, and on the south side, it goes to a thousand feet, and then there's kind of that gap there between the Yakima AVA and the Horse Heavens, and the reason they did that was there was no water up there. But Coe's actually got a vineyard, wow. Painted Hills Vineyard, that he's made wine from, that's in between the Yakima AVA and the Horse Heaven AVA, and so it's kind of in no man's land. It's in the Yakima Valley, geologically speaking, but it's not in where they drew the NBA because at the time they said, there's no water, we just arbitrarily a thousand feet. And, um, and so rattlesnakes generally, the concept is, I don't remember exactly why they did the Western boundary, the, so there in remember why they did the boundary. It's I mean there were discussions about whether the western half or that western part of the ABA that's along those there are a, a chain of 
of vineyards that go along that hillside. And um, mm -hmm. we've got a really cool video that's hard to show on Zoom, but I can send you guys the link if you want it, of okay. all the vineyards that go along that, that ridge line. And they don't really follow the same way when you get into the eastern half of the valley, but I don't know. The dad, dad, do you have thoughts? Okay, you're the right. um, eastern boundary is a power line. That's why it's so straight, uh, running from um, at that angle about forty-five degrees to the northeast. And that's not a soil definition, but it's simply that the weather seems to be different. Um, to the east of that power line that runs over the hills and to the west of it. And we had a blizzard last year that seemed to confirm that because it came from the north and fanned out. And if you were on the west side of the power line, you didn't get hammered like the people did on the east. And it was devastating on the east side of it. So for whatever reason, the power line is the eastern border. So there you go. Interesting. Yeah. Um, one of the other places in the world, the Drish, that the boundaries of the, the AVA is really contested is actually Kunuara because there's some of the Kunuara soils that they're more in patches, I think. And there's some of them, there's some non Kunuara soil types in the Kunuara AVA, and there's some Kunuara soil types outside of the AVA. So this is. Um, when you get to the boundaries and the edges, it's always a little bit where exactly do you draw the line? So, um, mm -hmm. Ed says, did the eruption of St. Helens change the soil in any way? We got a quarter inch, thanks Dad for the reminder, you're muted again. Um, we got a quarter inch of ash when Mount St. Helens erupted and there were a lot of other really cool articles that came out because this year was the 40th anniversary about uh, growers looking back at that time. Um, Ed also asked, are there any concerns if Mount Rainier goes? I hear it's overdue. George, how close are we going? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's difficult to project, but um, Rainier is more in danger of a cone collapse because it's just stewing in its own juices and there's, what, two and a half million people down slope of this thing that's um, got a cubic mile of water two miles high. You know, not a good thing, but um, yeah, it's it's on a you know humans. We don't live long enough. That's the problem. You know, so it could be five hundred or a thousand years. It's like every five hundred or so to get a major, you know, something that could affect it. <laughs> you think trees take a long time? The rock cycle is a really long time. <laughs> From granite to sand takes a long time. Back to granite again. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you said something. It about might be 2020. This year is kind of wild. Oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Don't right. say that, Kathy. Yeah. We need to reboot it. It's got a virus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We should have a New Year's Eve party at the end of June 2022.0. Making it happen. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. <laughs> oh, um, you said something else was an every half million years or so cycle. Was that the. Uh, that's the Yellowstone hotspot. Where are we? Um, in the that's where the yeah. Well, we're a ways away. Um, there, I mean, we're talking about things deep down, and so you've got a lot of geologists arguing about things, and I don't want to get into that. But it, it's we don't know. You can just see the record, and if that's gonna, um, if that's going to, you know, that's the best we have. The last one was about, um, you know, it's about every half million year cycle, something like that. It takes a long time to melt all that crust, but when it does, it's very explosive. It's like uh, Mount St. Helens, but 500 times more kind of thing. And so it's really bad when it happens. We don't want to, yeah, it's, it's, it's bad. But it probably won't happen. It probably won't affect your winery in the, Geologic <laughs> time. I don't know. <laughs> Hold on, Dad. I'm unmuting you. Did you have something? So I have a, a question for George. Um, 
when the basalt was at a lower elevation before the tectonic folds happened, the ancient Columbia River flowed over our vineyard and brought rocks from different parts of the um, Canadian Rockies. And so when geologists walk through, they see all these granitic rocks of different colors. And uh, so I didn't know if that was something that you subscribe to the theory that the ancient Columbia River brought stuff or? Well, there were rivers coming in from all sides. And so what typically happened was um, the um, hot spot would push things up and you'd get a, a high and you get all these flows coming out. And then when the, when the magma chamber was empty, then it would collapse. And a lot of the boulders I saw, like right around where Carrie's house is, are from um, eastern Idaho. There's quartzites, and I didn't see a lot of granite from Canada, but they could have been brought in by the glacial ice, too. Um, I think that's more likely. I don't know. The rivers um, typically are coming from, well, there could be Idaho batholith stuff coming in. That's batholith is a fancy term for granite. Um, so, yeah, there could be, but mostly what I saw was the rounded quartzite, you know, the, so that's a, a sandstone that's been metamorphosed. It's really hard, and some of them look like giant poker chips. You know, they're very rounded and flat, and those, I think, came from um, Idaho. But yeah, everything, you form lakes. Some of these lavas float into lakes, and you can actually see pillow lavas. Um, where they float into freshwater lakes. Some of them float into wet sediments. Um, if you know where the, um, the Horseshoe Bend quarry is on the <coughs> Natchez River, um, they were, well, and the one that's failing in Yakima, they're mining basalt that flowed into wet sediment and kind of went underneath it. And um, so it, it kind of exploded. So they have all these little basalt fragments in the sand and they're able to just mine it with a ripper and um, and then screen out the sand and get the basalt for um, for their you know it meets state spec because it's basalt but it's already crushed for them the problem is uh, they didn't put any benches in there and they didn't you know we know what happened I don't know what the latest is on that thing but um, they didn't do it right and nobody caught them in time and there's several other ones you know the one up the, the other one up the Natchez that that blocked it and and uh, created a landslide on 410 state route 410 but yeah so they were flowing from every every which way and then the the magma chamber would fill again and and these things would start flowing out and they followed the ancient river valleys a lot of them and when you look at um the stuff that made it all the way to Aberdeen, you know, made it to the coast. Um, that stuff formed an ancient valley. The valley has since eroded away, and the and the basalt forms a ridge now. But originally, it was a um, a valley bottom, and some of this stuff hit the sea, and it it went underneath the. Um, it's now called the Astoria Formation. It went underneath the the wet sediments it just kept going and going and going and then it got really wet and hot and it exploded up and that's what like the the sea stacks at cannon beach are a mixture of columbia river basalt and, and sand that just exploded to the, the surface they're they're pretty cool looking rocks actually and um so it was Pretty amazing. That was the the biggest flow. It's the the Grand Ron flows. You know, most of the stuff came out within about two million years, but it persisted until about six million years ago. It's huge worldwide event at the time. You know, all the the gases that came out of there and everything um, it must have been just tremendous. And where you see it, I was telling Carrie yesterday where you see like a state park advantage, the petrified forest and the, the baby rhino that was preserved and everything that had to have been, you know, a log jam on a, on a major river and the lava flowed over it and, um, and was able, and those things were actually preserved because if they'd been on land and knocked over by the, the hot lava, they would have, you know, instantly volatilized, but they weren't, you know, there, there was water there and the, the basalt flowed over it and then they're eventually petrified. So 
but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see all kinds of, you know, there's wherever from the Cascades or, or Canada, you know, and there's, there's some real experts in your area, you know, that, that have studied this their whole lives, like Steve Rydell and, and those guys in, in Richland, um, they're a good source of information on this stuff, so. But you're my expert today, so hard. Well, okay, and I've been to your vineyard, so, and I love your wine, so it's all good. <laughs> that qualifies, right? Yeah. It does. Or if you had a question, I'll mute you if I can. What was your question? Hold on, let me figure out how to. Did we lose you? Did you have a question, Harp? Yeah. Yes, yes. So, we, as George was saying, we don't have an understanding of the time geographics that, that, that he's talking about. I mean, six million years, two million years. This was back in like before Abraham, man. This was this stuff was going on, and you know, it's it's more than biblical. It's 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 pretty cool. And so the future is probably similar. Um, you know, you have to think about your your ancestors, Hugh and Kathy and Carrie, I mean, to preserve this, I mean, what, what could happen next over the next six million years? I mean, I want your vineyards to, to sustain themselves. <laughs> we'll work on the six million year planning horizon just for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. The, green new, the Green New Deal, we need it. <laughs> oh. Oh, George, how'd you get into geology? Why did I get into geology? Get oh, into I, I I flunked out of physics. <laughs> so I got into geology, so. You wanted to feel? No, I wanted to be out in the field. But yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm I was a chemistry major, and some of my roommates were taking geology, and they were going on these cool field trips, and it's like, hey, I want to do that. You know, so that's kind of how I got in it. <laughs> Plus, I was competing with all these pre-med students in in chemistry, and they're ruthless. So, rocks is more laid back and more fun. So, <laughs> well, sorry, Hugh. I didn't mean to. Um, <laughs> you doctors are good. Just some of these guys are pretty competitive. You know? <laughs> no, they're competitive. But yeah. Dad, we're glad you're not one of those competitive people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of the nice guys. He would have helped me in chemistry. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, Co, while we're talking about geology, you get grapes from some of the different areas in this picture. Do you have any thoughts or comments or questions on your any of your vineyards? Well, you know, I have a comment on the uh, Rattlesnake Hills, which is you know that that was really a contentious uh, ABA when it was when it was formed. But if you go to the uh, application for it, you can read the, the rationale. And um, it's interesting that the eastern boundary is a power line, but it it's on a ridge. And Hugh, you remember that ridge? That's that hill we go up right on uh, Independence before the dairy, just west of your house. And that ridge runs along to the northeast. And just once you get about four miles more to the east, there's a pass that goes where 241 goes over Rattlesnake Ridge. And that's kind of a dividing, uh, airflow dividing from the north. So there are, there are, some, there are some things about it that, that make sense. It's, a, it's, a high, it's all at a higher elevation than the, anything surrounding it. And on the west side, that's the Yakima River. So, it's a uh, that divides it, and there's not really many vineyards, ex with the exception of Red Willow to the west of, of that ABA. So it's a it's a blob in a way, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's it's in in the Yakima Valley so enormous. The, I mean, the the Rattlesnake Hills. It's, if you look at it, it's almost the same size as the the Waluk Slope ABA, you know, on its own. So it's um, just the same way that the Napa Valley has been subdivided. I think we're seeing the Yakima Valley getting subdivided. And um, I agree Snipes Mountain is a much more, um, it's a much more discreet, uh, easily definable 
hill with a very interesting geology and I, I saw some uh, grapes from from that area and uh, it has its own uh, gravelly uh, it actually has a, a formation called the Snipes Mountain conglomerate which is yes, probably yes. Just, uh, like the Ellensburg one of those formations is that correct George yes absolutely yes yeah, some of that is reworked um, according to Eric Schuster some of the um, the stuff, the caliche cemented stuff is um, the um, reworked Snipes Mountain Conglomerate. I didn't want to get too much in the weeds with names and all that, but yes, yeah, so there is some of that where they were, you know, dug that irrigation ditch that I forget when I was up there last and and you could see where you had to kind of rip through it to, to get it. It was cemented, but yeah. You know, another really interesting thing that, um, and I don't know if you can see, but uh, there's a little town called Bickleton. And Bickleton is, if you look, uh, it's kind of along, uh, it's, it's, if you went where it says Horse Heaven Hills ABA, if you just went due west of that, um, mm -hmm. it's up at about 3,000 feet. It's quite mm -hmm. high. And, uh, but it's, you know, we were driving out there one day and we stopped to take some pictures and we found all kinds, and this is up there. I mean, it, we're, it's 2,500 feet above where we are here. And um, there were, we stumbled upon a bunch of gravel that was up there that apparently, you know, the large cobbles that were, uh, apparently it's some of that same stuff uh, that was there prior to when the, when the hills came up. So it's a pretty, you know, the great thing about our area is not only is it great for, um, for growing grapes, but since it, since it's so dry, you can really see all the rocks just lying around on the ground. They're not covered up with plants or trees or things like that. So we have a real uh, fun place to study geology and uh, and observe it. And, and if you keep your eye peeled, you can see some really cool stuff. So next absolutely, time I mean those those are still going up. I mean you look at even um, you know where we like to ski at Mission Ridge, the um, the basalts are several thousand feet up. So this uplift is is pretty recent. It's still going up. So we haven't had an earthquake lately, but you know they do happen. The uh, interesting thing about Snipes is on the south side of Snipes Mountain proper, there's a road called Emerald Road, South Emerald. And when you drive along there, you can see the cutaways of all these geologic layers on top of each other. The most, I mean, it's you can go up a hundred feet and you'll see layer after layer of the things that George is talking about. So if you come to visit us and you want to see some geology and cross section, drive down the south side of Snipes and uh, you'll get to see it. Well, nice. and there is in the chat, there's calls for the geology field trip, which I think is funny because about a year, when did, when did we go hiking? That was, Fourth of July last year, and basically we got a oh, yeah. up and I said, George, talk to me, give me the geology 101, let's talk about the rocks that we're hiking through. And we've been talking about going on a geology tour of Eastern Washington and just driving around and looking at rocks and talking about rocks. And so apparently, George, we have to make this happen because we have a posse now. Because <laughs> yeah. Paul's coming, Adrish is coming, Robin and Scott, I'm assuming you guys are coming. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Cheers. Are you providing the wine? Of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll be there. Mm -hmm. I'll leave the house for you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, a girl can't be carriageless. Right. That is true. Because, so, you, um, you know how, is it Linus has his, or no, who's the one that has his, in Snoopy, that has the blanket? Like, their safety Linus. blanket? Linus. Linus has his blue blanket. Mm -hmm. Carriage house is that equivalent for Julie that she needs it at all, at all times just so she feels safe with carriage house. Right. That's right. <laughs> Something has to have a carriage. Right. Ed wanted to know is Red Mountain the rockiest? I don't actually know. Hmm. Oh, There's that's. Yeah. Huh. Anybody know how rocky Red Mountain is in comparison to everything else? Red Mountain. That's not a very big one, is it? Mm -hmm. I, think, mm -hmm. I thought they were more sandy soils and more influenced by the Missoula floods than um, that rocky per se. Yeah, than basalt type rocky. Yeah, I'll put that on our geology tour. Here we go. 
around. Well, we could take out the geologic map and cheat, you know. <laughs> look it up. <laughs> look it up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it doesn't look like they did. They go there on this tour. Go to your next. It looks like they did. Yes, they did. Oh, there's Red Mountain AVA. Yeah, that's what you're. So the paper that we sent in the, there's a link to the paper in the email this that went out on Monday. Okay. If you guys want to go back and read this all again, um, we make sure that you have the link. So how the soil types affect wine growth um, is a whole interesting conversation that I think they've done the most research on in, which is why we're drinking Riesling today, is they've done the most Riesling in Germany with this because how basically the most important part of how soil impacts vine growth is water capacity. How much, especially in an area where you get more rain than we do, um, how much water your soil holds is how much your vines will grow. And one of the advantages of Eastern Washington, specifically the Yakima Valley and the Wallook Slope, because we're in that really dry donut hole of precipitation. I mean, by the time you get, I think it was the next slide, by the time you get to Walla Walla, they get more precipitation. I mean, they're in another color or two of more precipitation than we get. And um, so the more water you have, the more your vines grow. The more you can, the less water you have, the more you can keep your canopy small, you can keep your berries small, you get nice airflow and light, or airflow, uh, light penetration. All of the things that make your, that give you the conditions for intense fruit and good flavor development, good phenolic development, come from not having too much water in your soil profile. So if you have rock, like basalt, you don't have as much water holding capacity than if you have a lot of, um, like a lot of those down in the valley floor in the Yakima Valley, down on the valley floor in the Walla Valley, where they have more Missoula flood siltation, you have more soil, you have more water holding capacity, you get more vine vigor. The, um, the other interesting thing about soils that I need to do more reading on specifically is how the different soil types impact, the different pHs, the different chemistries of your soil will impact how your vines can uptake nutrients. So if your if you're, if the pH of the soil is different, your nitrogen is going to be in a different form, which means it's not as easily uptaken and used by the vines. And so that is um, all of what, what's, what we talked a little bit about the basalt being deficient in potassium. One of the things that's important about that is that the vines need potassium to grow. It's an essential nutrient, but, uh, or mineral, but if they have too much of it, at the very end of the growing season, then there are there are parts of the plant that act like a straw, like in the in the trunk and in the cordons, and the and the water and nutrients flow up and down. And then there are sinks for those for things to get dumped in, or else the water will transpire out and go out the leaves. The um, potassium will end up in the berries, and if you get a lot of potassium in your berries at the end of the growing season you get, um, you will drop your pH, or you, your pH goes up, your acid goes down. And that's important because we, we know that acidity is one of the key things on how to make your wines food friendly, age worthy, and retain that life, that freshness and vivacity. And so if you have, I mean, Riesling is the perfect example. If you don't have acid in this wine, why would you why would you drink Riesling if you have this? Yeah. Um, but even in the reds, when they're too flabby, when they're too flabby, they don't age and they're heavy and they can be rich and voluptuous, but they fall flat. And so the combination of the soil profiles and the warm days, cool nights, uh, when it cools down at night, you don't lose the acidity in the second growing season. Uh, those two things add up together that we have really great and and the wines are that's a really really important part of what makes the wines age well and balanced and our balance and taste so 
And it's also why we can bottle these wines unfine and unfiltered, because if you have high pH wines, you, I mean, as we all know with COVID, you can increase your risk factors or decrease your risk factors. And pH really decreases all of your risk factors for, um, it decreases your risk factors for all this microbial spoilage. And so the lower your pH is, the, the harder it is for spoilage organisms to grow in your wines. So it, it really is one of the main tools that we have to be able to continue to bottle these wines unfine and unfiltered. I mean, obviously we have to do all the other things too. We have to pay attention to sanitation in the winery and blah, 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 blah. But even if we were doing everything else right, if you don't have low pH, it's really, 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 really hard. And so that's, um, I don't have any books on the impact of soil and wines from a scientific standpoint, Scott. Um, I just bought Marcus Keller's book, The Science of Grapevines. I don't know. I don't know what it's called. Marcus Keller's book. Um, it's very scientific. And if you don't, if you were a chemical engineer and you don't have a biology background, I don't know how accessible it is. Um, but it's got great references. And it's, I mean, it's a textbook. Um, I don't, I think there's a lot of people who write about soil and wine, but there's not as much science on soil and wine. And one of the challenges with that is you get a lot of, I feel like this happens. I drunk a lot of wines and I see these correlations, but wine is so amazingly complex. Like my, there, my thesis was controversial because we looked at what you do in the vineyard. It was an eight year, it was a culmination of an eight year study where we looked at what you did in the vineyard. And the question was, can you correlate what you do in the vineyard? And we had a 12 different things that we did in the vineyard and then looked at big data. If we could predict using mathematical modeling and AI, can you predict what's going to happen in the wine? And there were plenty of people including one on my thesis committee who didn't think that this was an incredibly valid method because there's so many factors that happen between the grapes when you harvest, harvesting to making wine. It is this even a valid comparison was now there's more of it happening, but 10 years ago, that was, this is one of the first studies that looked at what you do in the vineyard. Can you correlate it to what you see in the bottle? And, um, so I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, but if, send me, send me the book and I will, if I know the author, I'll tell you if they're, if I know of them, I'll tell you if they're a valid source or not, since I'm big right now on checking your sources. Um, what's the winemaker's dance, Beth? Are you muted? Do we have to unmute you? I'm not familiar with that. Hmm. I'll answer us in the chat if you, uh, I am not familiar with the winemaker's dance in Washington state. And um, Becky, your fritters look beautiful. Thanks for the picture. We always have to give a shout out to Becky for her cooking because she's getting better every week. Next thing should be coming up with the <laughs> recipes. I know. So, it is. Did you see that I added to the recipe? There was nope. a side salad too. Oh, oh, wow. oh my goodness! We're gonna. I don't know if you guys can see this. Becky is cooking beautifully. Hers mm. is prettier than mine. Look at that. I'm very proud. Wow. Very proud. Um, speaking of food. Quick plug before, I don't know if people have to go or not. Um, <laughs> Uh-oh, Becky, and sign me up. We're cooking forever this week. Um, next week we do have, uh, we're talking about food and wine pairings specifically because my friend Zach, who was the education director for the Tom Douglas Restaurants, he's a sommelier, I forget what his training is, and he, um, and he, is 
he's actually teaching classes right now on Washington wine and I think that Italian wine and then, but he's done food and wine pairing classes. He's going to talk about food and wine pairing next week and he's coming up with the food next week. So next week we're going to have Zach FedEx the food to everybody, not Becky, but the week after you might be on again, Becky, just for the record. And Tony, Ed's, if you make cinnamon rolls, Ed's going to be right there. He'll come over to your house and pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> so all right geology rocks yes rocks do rock um all right do we have any other questions for george or are we just going to wait for the geology tour that we're planning post-covid anybody anybody okay. all right well guys thank you for joining us all this was super fun Thanks, George. Thanks, George. And Julie. And Julie. Oh, for you're welcome. Cheers. Cheers. We will uh, see you guys all next week with more food, more mm -hmm. wine, more vineyard updates from Dad. And, um, and yeah, we, we're going to want Aaron to, to maybe throw in a couple of comments next week. So prepare him. Da, da, da. <laughs> you're muted. He's right here. Hi. So Hi. tell him. Again. What am I telling him? No, she's next, telling. Him. Next week we're doing food and wine. So next week we'll see you. Next week the Metropolitan Grill reopens, and I will be working the floor. Whoa! So I will be with you in spirit. Okay. Great. Well, then on Thursday, because nobody else will be with you on Wednesday. <laughs> on Thursday, they'll all come down and see you at the Met. <laughs> Maybe we can do a live from the Met. I like it. I like it. Happy hour from the bar at the Met. There you go. Huh? <laughs> Why not? Right. Yeah. Live on the edge. <laughs> we have the carriage house. There we go. Yeah, the carriage house. Yes. Yeah. All right. Exactly. All right. Well, thanks everybody. We will see you next week and uh, enjoy enjoy the rest of your evening and drink more Riesling. Thanks, okay. Gary. Cheers, cheers. <laughs> Bye, Bye, guys. Bye.